Apollo and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women as ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is bred of a philosophy of action that looks to integrate India's future for it to evolve, bred of a deep understanding and appreciation and encompassing of its aesthetic, its art, its cultural heritage. He's chairman of OCEAN, an organization that uh, embodies, represents, and carries forward his vision. He's an art curator. He's done a definitive book on Indian painting, uh, an unpublished novel, a man of vision and dreams for India. I'm delighted to welcome Neville Tully. Thank you. Neville, what is this driving vision, the, the core idea uh, that, that moves and, and impassions you? See, any core idea for any individual is simply to know oneself and to be free from that process. Um, the moment you are placed in a material context, um, you have a responsibility to that world. And India, uh, for whatever reasons, has become the focus of my own inner journey. And I came back to her um, at the age of 30, relatively. And after about two and a half years of traveling around, understanding her architectural heritage, her artistic heritage, going to every little monument, um, place where art, artisan um, work was being created, two, three things hit me immediately. Number one, that India was totally um, unable to take care, preserve, nurture, and contemporize her artistic cultural heritage. It was not playing any role in the development of the civilization. It was not able to take forward the idealism that many centuries of philosophizing creativity had brought to the surface. And as a result, there was something um, totally missing in the whole value system India was moving forward with. You have argued that uh, India w will not sort of achieve uh, it, 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 its due, its, its, its aspiration to be a, a superpower and, and, and move on, unless it recognizes and uses and celebrates uh, its, its heritage. And, and you were working extensively with you know, painting and, and through conservation and curating uh, exhibitions and, 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 and several elements of this uh, to, uh, to ensure that this happens. What is the relationship between this and, and, and the development of India in the material sense? Sure. See, any great civilization has three great value systems, the religious, the economic, and the cultural. For that civilization to truly boom, all three of these value systems must have a sense of equality and mutual respect and strength. All of them have material responsibilities. Culture, that is, it, the creative, artistic, intellectual energies of the human mind, have the requirement of building the material infrastructure. So far, we've always depended on patronage, whether it's government support, corporate sponsorship, or philanthropy. These have been the three crutches on which all material infrastructure for the arts have been based. I totally disagree with this being the basis. It has to be financially independent. It has to be self-sufficient. And the arts are the very more than capable of generating their own wealth, and more than that, redistributing that wealth to build the infrastructure. But when you look at that, that Indian tradition, uh, it, it has been a very inner-driven tradition, yes. uh, where art, in, in the sense that we understand it in the Western sense, of sort of an, an externalized expression of internal processes, uh, hasn't really been felt necessary by our civilization. Uh, the journey has been an intensely inner one. It hasn't needed the catharsis, the, the organizing of external ex, uh, of expression to be able to uh, pursue the, the, the inner journey in a sense. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, India is changing, those values are changing, uh, the aspirations are changing. So is this sort of Re more relevant to no. the new India? No, no, that, not that at all. It's fundamental in if a human being wishes to possess idealism, that same human being has the responsibility to transform that idealism into material form. It is not to be leased out to another value system, another organizational framework. It is the responsibility of that creative scholarly mind to put into action whatever visions, dreams they have. And India's biggest dilemma has been in separating these two worlds. 
of those who had the idealism, those who had the inner introspection, and those who were given the task of implementing it. The values that those people share are fundamentally different. There is no reason why the idealism will be transformed into action with those terms, with that honesty, with that sincerity, and with the inspirational quality that one foresaw when the first thoughts came about. India today is struggling to be true to her philosophies. She's struggling to be true to her spirituality. She's struggling to be true to her emotional honesty. Is that really the case? I think uh, a lot of people despair that India is in fact no longer struggling to be any of those things and is really now uh, you know, aspiring to, 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 to material development, to, uh, to, to the gratification purely of the external at the cost of the internal and, 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 and the kind of work you know, that you're doing, uh, it, 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 making art available uh, through auctions, through curating it, through exhibitions, uh, bringing in the economic dimension to art, maybe sort of debasing uh, it, it, it in some ways, right. you know, sort of the wonderful utopian ideal of art for art. Well, sake. Um, you know, it's <laughs> nice to have utopian ideals when you have hypocrisy at the basis of it, but let's understand one thing about the nature of art and inherent in art. Art has four dimensions. It has an aesthetic dimension, a historical dimension, a financial dimension, and a developmental dimension. And all these four dimensions exist in a legal context. India has, as you say rightly, always focused on the aesthetics, the inner joy, the inner expression of it all. The historical, she has only recently come to terms with since independence when she has herself got a certain self-confidence. The moment you take that art form out of the studio of the artist, or out of the home of the artisan. You bring it into a context which is material in its nature. That material context has its own logic. It has its own principles. The moment you disobey those principles, you will have conflict. The only way is do you want to overwhelm those principles, nurture them, discipline them with the value system you're bringing as a creative force. That means you have to understand the material context and responsibility. India. What did I do essentially? I essentially taught India the history of art so that she could understand the financial relationship between historical significance and financial valuation. We'll come right to that in a moment. You're watching a conversation with Neville Tully, um, art curator, art philosopher, and activist uh, for the role of art in the development of India. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with uh, Neville Tully. We were just talking about uh, the role of uh, art in, 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 in development. It was, it was a phrase you used. What do you mean by that? See, the factors of production that any nation has, land, capital, labor, these are the things by which we build our societies. We give employment to our people. We tackle all the problems from poverty to inequality to what else. There's another very important factor of production which somehow we have let slip. That is intellectual capital. In a sense, the software industry has shown India the ability to attach value to intellectual capital. And she's got a certain respectability internationally within her own people, a new professionalism, a new confidence has emerged because of the software industry. And it's been seen as the great sunrise knowledge sector. But the true knowledge sector of any civilization is the artistic and cultural heritage. Now, Inherent in that heritage is deep intellectual capital. That intellectual capital finds forms to publications, archives, libraries, museums, a whole host of things. And we've seen that go on for 60 years. Nehru had that first vision of creating the cultural infrastructure. Thereafter, when it started to disintegrate in the 70s, nothing new emerged. Today, when one looked at the problem in front of oneself, one realized that the trigger that is required, and yes, this is something which is of today, that economics as a catalyst, as a trigger to inspire people to take a certain responsibility, to get involved in a certain participation, and then to fall in love. There is no great love in art today. The love has come or will emerge because there is an economic incentive. Now, if you call that debasing of the process, fair enough. At the end of the day, the love will emerge because the moment value is attached, they will want to preserve it. 
they will want to publish it, they will want to share it. There is an openness of attitude, there is a confidence. Museums will be built, archives will be built, new libraries will come about. It will get integrated into the educational framework. Fathers and mothers will tell their children, become an artist. So, you, you, you know, you, the, that sort of really, uh, you know, you have so uh, eloquently uh, articulated the, the sort of philosophical framework of, of what you do, uh, you know, working towards building up the cultural infrastructure of India and, and it, it going beyond being uh, the obligation or, or the preserve of government and, and that, that individual civil society, the community uh, begins to become stakeholders yes. uh, in that process. And, and, and a process that you feel is uh, needs to be driven uh, by uh, economics uh, because... As one weapon, like knowledge, like mm -hmm. beauty, mm -hmm. economics is a weapon. Mm -hmm. It can be used with great integrity, it mm -hmm. can be used to debase society. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. question is, do we understand the nature of wealth? Mm -hmm. And at mm -hmm. the end of the day, that is one of the major intellectual problems that India's face, mm -hmm. that the intelligentsia, the academia, has shied away from this responsibility, mm -hmm. from taking on this weapon. Mm -hmm. Now, I have absolutely no qualms in believing that no creative mind of any integrity will ever be corrupted by wealth. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. The arrogance inherent in a true creative spirit mm -hmm. can never be conquered by economic forces. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm that they cannot cope with economic forces or they cannot use economic forces is a totally different issue. But frequently there is this sort of divide uh, between people who mediate between the creative energy of the artist and, 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 and make this available and, 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 and process this in a sense through the market forces. Uh, so you know, looking concretely at, at, at the initiatives uh, that you've done in, in, in less than uh, perhaps or, or about a decade uh, since you came back from your uh, degrees at the London School of Economics and, and Oxford University in, in looking at development economics. Uh, you have made a remarkable uh, impact uh, in, in, in several spheres, uh, you know, certainly uh, in, in uh, how do I put this, in ordering, uh, legitimizing and in bringing about accountability and transparency. Um, in uh, the the sale of uh, the sale and purchase and and and, uh, and the dissemination of dissemination okay. of, of art and, and, and artworks and cinema well, we'll come to that tell us a little bit about uh, uh, you know, that kind of work uh, that you do acquire paintings um, you've come up with a definitive book on on Indian painting uh, you've come up with wonderful catalogs that have supported uh, this process what is the aspiration of this you see Remember, one key th battle that had to be fought very early on was destroying the black economy. Because most of the arts of India, still today, are all rooted in the black economy, in the suppressed economy. They are not accountable to the public, let alone having value. They don't play any role. Ask yourself today a question, you have 800 galleries showing modern art, and you don't have two private sector galleries showing the miniatures, or Gutta sculptures, or Chola bronzes. No, why? Because essentially the whole system has been skewed in a certain way which has sent the cultural artifacts underground. Now the question was, if you're going to change not just the black economy, but change the attitudes with which it comes, an attitude of hiding, an attitude of um, not having that confidence and pride of showing and sharing and disseminating, you have to create a platform in which you are publicly accountable. That means your mistakes are shown as much as your achievements. Now an auction house in the traditional sense as Christie's and Sotheby's had developed in the West, I always wondered why isn't it that Christie's and Sotheby's are the world's greatest universities? Because for 200 years every major art form has come through their hands. Why is it that they never documented this, created structures for education and built great universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard? So, when I came in to build an auction house, I had a totally different vision. I said, yes, the auction house would be a means of creating public profiles, accountability, doing research, creating the wealth, making the financial benchmarks. But at inception, from day one, simultaneously the archive would be built so that the knowledge base which underpins all development of the arts would systematically be built. Today, people know about the auction house side, but they don't realize that Oceans is the world's largest archive library collection of India's contemporary culture, of 300 years of everything that India has been doing in fine arts, cinema, architecture, photography, advertising, political propaganda, and now we are venturing into Asian arts. Now, when the student bodies have direct access to these art forms in 
books, original paintings, sculptures, documents, maps, charts, everything, like their birthright, the confidence that comes into the student body, their aspiration towards excellence, wanting to learn, that joy of learning returns. India has lost her joy of learning. She, her education system has fallen to such a level, apart from certain vocational issues. But you cannot change an educational system, especially for the arts, unless you first empower the intelligentsia and the creative communities. What makes this financial infrastructure that you're, you're creating, not financial, the, these artistic, creative, aesthetic infrastructure that you're creating, financially viable? The auction, house. The auction house. The auction house. That we attached value to something which had no value. And unlike other auction houses, we also took a certain principal stake. And more than that, we decided to build institutions which would nurture this. I'll give you a very simple how we take the easy way out. Let's take our architectural heritage, the biggest dilemma face in India's cultural heritage. The easy thing is to charge tickets for someone to venture into. I'm not against that on one level, but this is public property. To ask your people to pay even one rupee to come and see the Taj Mahal or the Fatehpur Sikri or any major monument, I feel is essentially ethically wrong. But no one wants to take the responsibilities of building other institutional frameworks in which wealth can be created because it's far more difficult, it requires so much more forward thinking, it requires the integration of so many different forces. There is no reason in the world that each of our great monuments could not become not just centers for tourism, but centers for environmental policy, artisan policy, labor policy, centers of resource and education and nurturing the excitement that they once were. But to do this, you need a very clear developmental vision. But forget the vision, you first have to understand the problem. And more than understanding the problem, you have to understand the neglect of the greatest asset your country has, how we have totally neglected its developmental dimension. More of that in a moment. You're watching a conversation with uh, Neville Tully, who I've described as a, um, an art aesthetic activist and, and, and for its role in India's development. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Neville Tully. Uh, you, you have written about your, your vision. You've just been talking about uh, education. You've written about your vision of uh, developing universities in India on the lines and scale and achievements and stature of Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard. And you just mentioned that earlier in the conversation uh, on, on, on a five-year time frame. What is that vision? How is it unfolding? As you know, our educational framework is going through various dilemmas. And um, it's not mine to comment on the obligations we have. We have a very diverse populace and we have to do justice to many sectors. But at the heart of any educational process has to be the joy of learning. If the joy of learning is taken out of the system, no amount of information, no amount of knowledge will serve any purpose, let alone for the individual, but for the country and the nation. What are you doing? How are you going about setting up well, uh, these, these the structures most important and point, The most important point was the archive. Today, Oceans owns nearly one million artworks. It's the world's largest uh, collection of great art forms which one day will be the hub of the university. To what degree do you see this this huge uh, uh, volume, this, this huge sort of reserve of, of, of artworks uh, held in the public trust? Well, you see, here yeah. comes another dilemma that uh -huh. the whole legal framework with which we have expected our charities, our educational institutes, our cultural institutes to be built in. When I came back to India, I built a charitable society. It took me five years to realize that the corruption inherent in the system will never allow a charity or a trust to go beyond the margins because inherent in the framework is a financial dependency that you will always be, even if you work with the total integrity, you will always be dependent on another value system who does not share your passion and vision for finance. And the moment that occurs, you will never be able to go beyond a certain level. So the corporate entity, the only entity which has actually sustained itself across the world, the question is, can you build great art and cultural educational institutes using the corporate entity as a legal framework? At the end of the day, if a man is corrupt, he's going to be corrupt in the corporate entity as much as in the trust. If you are going to trust your people and you're going to believe in their integrity, then give them the freedom to put it into action. So I chose, Oceans was built then as a corporate entity in 2000. Stop in the charity because there were just too many um, impositions which I found to be totally unethical. Today, one is capable of doing 10 times the charity through a corporate entity, simply because the freedom to build things 
as demanded by economics. Remember, there's an inherent logic in economics. If you're going to create wealth and thereafter redistribute that wealth, you have to obey certain principles. Just like with aesthetics, if you disregard the essence of aesthetic understanding, no amount of wealth is going to change the system. So similarly, our people had to take on, any cultural institution building process has to take on this duality of creating both knowledge bases and simultaneously the financial underpinnings of it. And unless you're willing to take on both of these responsibilities, you're not going to change a system. And at the end of the day, you may be part of a system, but the fundamental aim here is that you have an educational framework, you have a, so, a kind of cultural developmental framework which is deeply flawed. So tell us about these new university of the university that's going to change the face well, uh, of education. Whether in we India change or not, the, the aspiration the, is there. Uh -huh. And the aspiration needs to obviously carry people. Mm -hmm. you know, most things in India need to bring in a new sense of love and passion. Now, if you are going to genuinely um, institutionalize love in a new way, and it's always it's a, a much abused word, so it's, um, I use it with great hesitation. But at the end of the day, the individual passion has to permeate into systems, guidelines, mechanisms, institutional frameworks. That can only be done if you are carrying a whole host of people across the spectrum, which India fully recognizes. Now, you have to take a call. Are you going to subsidize? And subsidy is necessary. There's no two ways about it. I'll give you the simple example about cinema. At the end of the day, the Asian Film Festival, which we have, Ocean Cinefan, we did not take any funding. We did not take any support. Essentially, modern art supports Asian cinema. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, no one in the world would have imagined that by selling a Sousa painting or a Swaminathan painting, you can bring the finest Asian cinema and share it with 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, that degree of cross-subsidization is inherent in any form. The government understands it. They may try the quota system, reservations. But the question is, is that the best way also to bring in excellence? merit and is it what gives confidence to the whole system if you are going to undermine the confidence of the finest minds of the people who are the most dedicated and the most honest you are on a very very difficult long-term vision it's mm -hmm. not sustainable sooner or later it will lead to conflict but much of this uh, the approach that you're talking about uh, it depends on the, you know, the, the motivation of the individual yes. uh, behind this, and in, in that's this, the strength in case, and the weakness. You, uh, and, and, and and the strengths are, are, are obvious and apparent. But are you creating uh, systems and processes? And you're a young man, middle <laughs> that age. You feel middle aged. <laughs> that you feel, uh, you know, can be replicated, will endure beyond your uh, direct absolutely. intervention and participation. Uh, will they have to be matched by another individual, individuals who will, who will carry your value systems? You see, um, there is a daily conflict between uh, certain things the individual can do and the institution can never do. And we all are very deeply aware of the indispensability of the individual and when they pass away, the whole institution falls apart. But I built uh, whatever I'm trying to build with the very clear recognition. I gave myself 10 years to dissolve my significance or importance or role or relevance and redefine it. Today, 70 people work with OCEANS. Um, they come from all backgrounds, some of the finest minds to basic people who were once um, sweepers who are turning out to be software engineers or um, database archivists for our subjects. Now the question is, you need a model which inspires others to better it, to replicate it or to criticize it. Now that model has to be something that is as all-encompassing as what you are trying to replace. If at the end of the day we say patronage is not a self the most important way, it's, it's one rule, it's one part, and you are going to create a financially self-sufficient framework which creates the knowledge bases, shares those knowledge bases, takes it forward, then obviously it's no longer something about the individual. Mm -hmm. It has to go beyond. But you've got, as you clearly mentioned, within creativity, there is something which is individual-centric. Unless you change the sensibilities of the public, and the energy comes from the public, which is not able to tolerate or not willing to tolerate certain mediocrities, it's not willing to talk, uh, tolerate certain um, compromises in its educational framework, in it, the arts it's shared with, the complacency gets deeper. So along with transforming the individual, you have to transform everyone in this journey. 
Now, obviously, that is what one is trying to do. Others are joining. Many others are taking up their own models. The momentum, as you can clearly see in the last six years, has fundamentally changed. The energy levels have changed. And at the end of the day, all you can do is create an atmosphere in which we are not willing to tolerate some of the mediocrity and corruption that we were earlier willing to tolerate. So there's this sort of middle-aged, and that's how you described yourself, uh, yeah. activist, his, his passion uh, with this external sort of world unfolding, uh, perhaps mirroring the, 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 the inner interior journey. Um, in, in what ways do you feel yourself personally changed, transformed, evolved? Uh, through this, through this decade of, of engaging, uh, from 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 a past that you've you know, you've described that uh, you know you drew much of your your passion and energy and skills from from gambling in the, in the race courses of London, uh, and then and how sort of these skills got got fine tuned and honed. What is in being? See, as mentioned right at the beginning, um, every human being, and I feel with no exception, maybe with different degrees of awareness, is essentially searching for. Uh, inner peace with one's um, sense of who one is, why one is here, and a sense of freedom from that. Do you find yourself just that little bit closer to that? At the, oh, the, yes, at the uh, without, without a shadow of a doubt. But at the same time, as you get closer to something which is usually very elusive, the, the nature of the conflict ironically gets deeper. And uh, I leave you one of the deepest conflicts I face, um, that between action and inaction, or between being the philosopher or the actor activist and combining both of them. And every um, creative mind, every scholarly, academically driven mind faces that, that they don't want to sh fight a certain battle, especially not fight on a daily basis. Because the joy, the love, the idealism is every day beaten up. And somewhere you have to rejuvenate yourself to fight as if yesterday was not the way it was. Now, obviously, as you get tired physically, mentally, energetically wise, that battle becomes more and more dangerous for you to sustain. But I am quite convinced that all of us, if we are sincere and um, true to that inner voice, will reach a phase where many others will come to take forward. In a way, well, Neville Tully, here yes, celebrating that possibility <laughs> and, and the juxtaposition of the, 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 the stillness inside with action outside. Thank you very much. This Welcome. has been a great privilege. Thank you. And a great